honor and privilege to oh I just got the notice that it's recording. Um, it's it's such an honor and a privilege to be with you all today. When Philip introduced me to the work of the West African Transitional Justice Center, I was absolutely delighted and so excited to hear that this budding community was forming um, around the sort of intersection between peace and security studies and conflict prevention and transitional justice. And I'm really excited to be, um, to be here speaking with you today. I'd also, in addition to, to really sincerely thanking Philip for the extraordinary amount of work that he's put into not only this event, but this broader um, program, which I think is just so valuable. I'd also like to thank Brice, um, who's joining us today. It's great to see you. Um, and then to everyone who's calling in, um, I'm going to try and keep my remarks fairly, fairly succinct, um, keeping, keeping to the time if I can, um, so that we have plenty of time for questions. And I really do um, hope that we can have a fruitful discussion afterwards. I'm going to share my screen now so that um, you can see a presentation that I've put together. Um, I think this means that you won't be able to see my face for a while, um, but, but I hope that, uh, <laughs> that the content of the PowerPoint presentation is, uh, is, is um, interesting. Okay, so one sec, I'll just share my screen. Oh, I think I'm not permitted to share my screen, perhaps. Um, can you make the other Sarah McIntosh that you see there a co-host as well? I think that will fix it. Okay. Yeah, it's done. Great. Okay. Um, can everyone, I hope you can all see that. Let me know if there's any problems. Um, so I guess what I'll do is um, first, as, uh, as Philip mentioned, I work at the Simon Scott Center for the Prevention of Genocide. Um, and I work in a particular initiative within that center, but I wanted to zoom out a little bit first. Um, I imagine that many of you calling in today um, are not familiar with our work at the center. Um, and I wanted to make sure that it's kind of made sense for those of you who are, thanks for bearing with me while I, while I talk us through this. Um, but the Simon Scott Center is a center within the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, as Philip mentioned. Um, and we were really established as a living memorial to the victims of the Holocaust. And our mission and mandate is to work uh, to do for today's uh, victims um, that which was not done for the Jews of the Holocaust um, during the 1930s and 1940s. And I think this is where what, what Philip said about the importance of um, putting victims at the center really comes in. We do this um, in a few ways. One, by alerting the national conscience in the US public to what's going on around the world. We seek to influence policymakers and to stimulate worldwide action, uh, both to prevent atrocities um, and also to advance justice and accountability. And we often say that we work at all stages of the atrocity cycle. Um, so we do early warning work um, and that involves, and, and for those of you who are familiar with our work, I imagine this may be the piece of our work that you're most familiar with. Um, and that work focuses on highlighting cases where atrocities may occur and where action can actually be taken um, to prevent those. Um, one of the beliefs of our, our center around which we're, we're focused is that there actually are things that can be done to prevent genocide um, and similar mass atrocities. And so what we seek to do is to encourage decision makers to take that action. We also recognize that often these preventative measures are not possible. Um, they don't always succeed. And so we, we seek to shine a spotlight on cases that are unfolding. Um, we have done considerable amount of work on the Rohingya situation and have recently um, launched an exhibit in the physical museum and also online that shines a spotlight on the plight of the Rohingya. And I encourage those of you who are interested to take a look at that online. We've also done work on Syria 
and on the Uyghur situation, um, I primarily focus on South Sudan and um, the effort to pursue justice and prevent future atrocities there. Um, so I might move on to kind of the handbook itself, um, which is, as Philip mentioned, available online. It's also available in hard copy. And I'll give my email address at the end for those of you who would like to receive um, a hard copy. I can arrange to send that to you. Um, so just a few basics that I wanted to run through just to orient us. Um, the handbook is a practical guide. It's a practical resource, not a scholarly work. Um, and the aim of it is really to provide victim groups with practical strategies and tools that they need to press for justice, despite the immensely strong political headwinds that, that are countervailing and, and make that a really difficult and lofty goal to achieve. We produced it because we wanted to fill a gap in the literature that we had observed um, in the sense that there is, there is uh, plenty of material written directed at the international community about what they can do to make their, uh, their, their projects more victim-centered. But what there wasn't so much of was guidance for victim groups specifically. There is guidance for civil society, but specifically for victim groups about what they can do to interact with and engage with the system as it currently operates despite all of its flaws, recognizing that the burden doesn't and shouldn't fall on victims to, to fix this system, but rather to know how to navigate it um, despite, despite its imperfections. So in a sense, you know, our, our primary audience is, of course, um, victim groups. And by that, we mean groups of affected communities that have come together, perhaps as very informal associations, um, particularly at the beginning when uh, the goal really is for mutual support and assistance. But sometimes these groups begin over time to develop more long-term strategies about advancing justice um, and, and other kinds of uh, preventative activities as well. And, and so we, we want to reach those audiences. But in doing so, we also kind of have, have a number of other secondary audiences that in many ways um, are, are very closely uh, related. One is of course, um, civil society, those who work closely with victim groups. And while it's written um, from the perspective of victim groups, um, we've, we've spoken to many civil society folks who have also found it um, really interesting food, food for thought in terms of engagement with victim groups and how to put them exactly as Philip said in the center. Um, it's also a variety of other audiences, including particularly law students. Um, and perhaps at the end, I can tell you a little bit more about that. Um, the final thing that I wanted to say, just in terms of framing the handbook, um, and it kind of ties back into my first point, which is that the handbook includes recommendations and information. Um, and to sort of answer this second last question about how we research and wrote it, um, it, it contains these recommendations that are based on consultations with over 90 experts um, that also draw on a combination of desk research and on our own uh, professional experience working with victim groups to advance justice. Um, and so it's not so much um, containing uh, hard research findings so much as recommendations, guidance, advice, and information about the justice system. So I wanted to give a snapshot of what the, what the handbook actually covers. I'm gonna go into some of these um, chapters in a little bit more detail. I understand that, uh, that no one can probably read this slide, but I just wanted to give a sense of kind of the broad spectrum of topics. Um, the handbook is divided into three sections. One is on kind of laying some foundational concepts um, and sort of providing some really basic information to victim groups about the international justice architecture. The second section is really the meat of the handbook, and it's about what victim groups can do to generate support and to actually implement strategies to pursue the goals um, and outcomes that are identified in part one. 
And then the, the third part of the handbook acknowledges that there are some really practical challenges, one being having funding um, for victim groups to do this kind of work. I think sometimes um, as the international community, um, we, we tend to, um, there is perhaps a tendency to think that um, victim groups are able to do this, um, this kind of work pro bono and civil society, um, which is simply not sustainable. And so we wanted to include a section on what victim groups can do to get support um, to do this really important work. Um, I wanted, before diving into kind of each chapter, and I'll, I'll walk through um, the chapters in varying levels of detail based on what I think will be most relevant and useful to to you today, but I did want to flag one thing that I that I won't mention later on, which is that the handbook um, has a really interesting section in the introduction that my colleague Megan Omani, who's a PhD candidate in museum studies at the London School of Economics, about what victim groups did to advance transitional justice after the Holocaust recognizing, and this is an important theme that's woven throughout that I'll talk about in a minute, that justice in the aftermath of mass atrocities is not limited to criminal accountability, but it also involves and requires a broader set of measures beyond just taking someone to court. Um, and so while when we talk about the Holocaust, we often think about um, the Nuremberg tribunals um, and, and their contribution, the critical contribution that that made um, to justice. There are also other sometimes overlooked dimensions of that, which the handbook talks through. And I, I really encourage you to take a look at that. It's quite, it's quite a fantastic section. So this is this, this, um, this uh, kind of part one of the handbook, which really lays the groundwork for the rest of the handbook um, and particularly chapter one, I'm going to spend um, most of my time talking about this and then we'll kind of relatively quickly take you through the other chapters. And the reason why I wanted to focus in on this chapter is because it really provides a framework um, and, and kind of sets some theoretical um, bases for why transitional justice might be important, how different transitional justice mechanisms interact with, with each other and um, what they look like in practice. And particularly, again, I, I keep coming back to what Philip said because he he could not have put it um, put it better. I, I could not have put it better myself. Is to say that the focus here is not only on explaining the foundational concepts, but also really zeroing in on what victim groups can actually do to advance them. Um, and so you'll see in this second um, part of chapter one, um, I'm hovering my, my mouse over it now, um, we, we kind of walk through some different um, specific transitional justice goals that we can have beyond criminal accountability. Um, so one of them, um, when, when we talk about transitional justice, often we talk about and expect to see um, for those of you who are familiar with transitional justice, four pillars, so to speak, that focus on justice, truth-telling, uh, reparations, and measures of non-recurrence. And they're sometimes kind of divided into separate categories which predetermine the particular programs that might be involved in transitional justice efforts. But what we wanted to do was to kind of appreciate the interconnectedness of each of these different goals and the way that different mechanisms can pursue those goals. And so we decided not to follow that sort of traditional um, four pillar approach and instead to break it down uh, according to specific measures. One again um, of the measures that I, that I really wanna draw um, attention to is this section here on memorializing the past. Again, um, this section was also written, it's the, the other section of the handbook that was written by Meg Omani um, and the, the rest of the handbook I authored, but I wanted to draw attention to it because I think it's a really unique and interesting contribution of the handbook about what can be done to memorialize the past and how victims can play a really active role in that. 
Um, so I really encourage those of you who want to get a broader sense of what transitional justice can look like to kind of dive into this chapter more closely and perhaps um, if people would like to have a discussion afterwards about these different measures and I can kind of talk through some of them in more detail, um, reparations programs, memorializing the past, truth commissions, searching for missing persons, measures of non-recurrence, public apologies and reconciliation and social cohesion, then, um, then I think that could be an interesting territory for us to discuss. So in terms of this kind of laying the groundwork section, we also have, um, we also have a chapter on um, what legal tools exist for holding people to account, but also for pushing more broadly for justice and accountability. And what we wanted to highlight here is that criminal justice, again, is a very important part of, of transitional justice, but that there are actually many other kinds of legal tools that are available um, to assist, um, assist in the broader fight for, for, um, for transitional justice. And so here I've, I've actually taken a photo of the hard copy of the handbook, but you can find these pages on pages 43, 44, and 45 of the handbook, which set out some different legal options that are available for building towards uh, justice and accountability. So we have, of course, the criminal, criminal aspect where we hold um, individual perpetrators to account. Um, and that's where we see institutions like the ICC, for instance, there are then state responsibility mechanisms, and here we have institutions like the International Court of Justice, where the Gambia is, um, for example, at the moment, bringing a case um, against the Myanmar government um, for genocide against the Rohingya community. Um, and then we also have, um, and, and that's where we really see the potential for big reparations orders, again, tying back into the first chapter that I mentioned. Um, and then we have a uh, kind of civil liability mechanisms. This is slightly more technical. And for those of you who are interested, I encourage you to take a look at page 40, 44 and 45 of the handbook. But the purpose of these mechanisms is to find ways to hold corporations and individuals civilly liable, um, meaning not under criminal law, but for private wrongs committed against individuals and communities. And so we think here of the corporations, for instance, that profit from or are complicit in um, armed conflict and, and atrocities perpetrated there. Um, I won't go into all of the details of the HMS, if you wouldn't mind putting yourself on mute, thank you. Um, so I'm going to move along um, in the spirit of keeping this as brief as possible. As I said at the start, the real meat of the handbook is um, lies in this second part about what victim groups can do to generate support um, for their efforts. Um, the first, and this is uh, perhaps a somewhat unique contribution of the handbook, um, something that certainly has been discussed before, but which we really wanted to draw attention to, which is the notion of building sustainable coalitions across affected communities. And so the idea here is to, um, is to I, have, I, have I dropped off? Um, let me just see. Um, Philip, can you let me know if I've dropped off? No, you're fine, you're fine. Oh. Okay, um, yeah. and so what we wanted to focus in on here are cases in which um, uh, victim groups have come together across different divides, across different communities that haven't always worked together um, in order to advance a common goal of justice. And so a case here that we, will, that we look at is the efforts of, of Chadian victims led by Suleiman Gang Gang to come together across different affected communities to gather information and take the decades long fight to press for justice um, against Hussein Habre, ultimately resulting in the conviction of, of the former president in the extraordinary African chambers in Senegal, which 
um, the whole effort has been described as an interminable legal soap opera. And I think it's, it just highlights the importance and value and contribution that victims made to really driving those efforts forward. Another case that we look at here um, are the efforts of victim groups in Guatemala. Um, and again, we see here the ability of, of victim groups to come together across different divides in order to press for justice and accountability against, against um, former, former President Rios Montt um, for genocide. And the, and the idea here is to recognize on the one hand, it's not always possible or appropriate for victim groups to come together. There may be geographical and technical limitations that make it hard. There may also be historical grievances between communities that make coming together difficult. But what we wanna say is that where possible, um, the, the bringing together of different communities around a common goal has been a really valuable and helpful strategy for advancing justice in some cases. And, and we wanted to draw attention to that. Um, we've got here on pages 71 and 72 of the handbook, um, again, I wanted to sort of point out one of these um, visual tools in the handbook about different models of organization. Um, and I think that the, the, the second one here that I'm hovering my mouse over um, is, is sort of about um, coming around a common goal and using the different skills of different members of that group to um, advance justice. So we have um, perhaps experts in strategic communication, others in gathering information, some in fundraising that may operate in slightly independent spheres, but have a common goal of pursuing transitional justice. Um, but this other um, model that's discussed on page 71 here um, focuses, it's, it's more of a concentric circles model, so to speak, where you have victims and survivors at the center and then cushioned and cocooned by a broader set of actors who have um, varying levels of involvement um, in the affected crimes and what we wanted affected communities. And what we wanted to do was to show that, that victim groups themselves can and should be at the heart of these efforts and be the leaders and that their civil society allies, the international community can serve around them to help pursue their goal um, rather than imposing their goals from the outside. Um, and so the handbook talks in more detail about what this can actually look like, what this can mean and other modes of, of organization. But I, I wanted to briefly draw your attention to that. Now this section that um, the sort of fourth chapter here is about gathering and sharing information. And just to clarify for those of you who are familiar with human rights documentation work, our goal here is not to talk about documentation, um, that being an extremely um, kind of technical uh, process that involves um, substantial training and expertise that we are not in a position to provide in the form of a short handbook. Um, and, and as the, the Holocaust Museum, um, our role is not to kind of gather um, eyewitness testimony and to preserve and store evidence. So what we wanted to do was, was demonstrate that there are many other kinds of information beyond gathering testimony, which of course is, is an absolutely critical part of building justice and accountability. Um, and I wanted to draw attention to it because there are a couple of places here where academics and scholars can play a really interesting role. In particular here, we have um, facts and figures um, that scholars may be well-placed to obtain including community surveys about what victim groups actually want to achieve in terms of their transitional justice goals. Um, and so I'll come back to this in a minute in terms of contributions that um, scholars and academics can make, um, particularly um, from regions like West Africa, um, where many scholars themselves may come from affected communities and perhaps potentially even have been victims of these crimes um, and what they can do in their professional and perhaps personal capacity uh, to advance these efforts. Um, whizzing through, um, I won't delve too deeply into chapter five. It's quite a meaty and technical chapter, maybe one of the harder ones um, to sort of 
re requires a, a bit of attention and focus to get through. But the idea, the, the basic idea of it is relatively straightforward, which is what can victim groups do to make their voices heard among um, policymakers and, and diplomatic actors? How can they make their voices heard above the, the, the flurry of, of discussion that surrounds um, the, the community of actors who are working to pursue justice? Um, and, you know, we, we think about, for instance, how the international attention is very rightly focused on crises like um, Afghanistan that Philip mentioned earlier, like Ethiopia, and at the same time acknowledging that there are also places where people are waiting for atrocities and that sometimes attention zeroes in on the hot active cases right now. Um, and when I start, say hot, I mean um, active conflicts. Um, rather than cases that have occurred in the past where attention may have waned and it may be more difficult to excite and get policymakers on board with actually doing something. So if you're interested in that, I encourage you to take a look there. Um, the final section in this chapter is about strategic communications. Um, and again, I won't go into this too much, um, but I encourage those of you who want to think about what you can do to build, um, build a public demand for justice. Um, again, I might zero in on one, of, one specific element of these in a moment when I talk about what academics can do. Finally, there's this section, as I said, on confronting the practical challenges. We have a section on anticipating and mitigating risks. And I draw your attention to the section on re-traumatization and secondary trauma. Um, and then also on fundraising that I mentioned earlier. So very briefly, I'm just going to wrap up. I know that um, I'm now going slightly over time, but, but I wanted to sort of give to zoom back out and give a few reflections on um, what we found in our research and some of the recommendations that the handbook contains. One is that transitional justice is one possible framework that victim groups can use to advance justice after mass atrocities. And I'll just bookmark that. I'm gonna come back to that in one minute. Um, one is that the, the, the other finding that I wanted to draw attention to um, was the extent to which um, victims of mass atrocities and affected communities have been powerful justice champions in the past, like I discussed a few minutes ago. Um, and sort of tied into that as well, the value of working across affected communities. Um, and then the sort of final reflection that, it, that isn't necessarily a new offering, but one that's really worth emphasizing is that justice outcomes don't always meet community expectations and they often take decades to achieve. And the reason why I wanted to kind of draw attention to those findings, particularly for you, is, um, is just to shine kind of a bit of a spotlight to highlight some areas for further research um, and important questions that I think could really benefit from scholars such as yourself delving into in more detail if you're interested. So I wanted to just flag that um, there are a couple of areas that, as I said, um, more attention could be useful. One is on, and I've, I've jumped to the bottom dot point of this slide, I'm just jumping around a little bit. But one is about what qualities actually make victim coalitions effective. Um, so what is it about the effective victim coalitions? What are their characteristics that help them to get their voice heard above the fray? What environments and contexts can they be effective um, justice champions? Um, and I think that in the handbook, we talk a lot about what victim groups drawing on past cases have done in the past. But I think drawing those broader conclusions about these particular qualities can make an effective um, effective coalition is one um, in this specific context of pursuing justice is one that merits further research. The other is how transitional justice mechanisms beyond criminal accountability can help to prevent conflict and its recurrence. Um, and so we have a lot of research and um, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with this about what criminal accountability to do can do to deter perpetrators. Um, and this is somewhat of a contentious area. It's a difficult area to 
kind of um, prove, I suppose. But a couple of years ago, we hosted a seminar that focused on, um, on the broader question of transitional justice and, and accountability, um, and, and then also how that ties into conflict prevention. Um, and uh, if, if, the, if there are um, people on the call that are interested in finding a little bit more about that seminar and the kind of specific research questions that might be interesting, please do reach out. Um, and the final uh, is, is sort of thinking again, can we blur open the framework of transitional justice, particularly when it's divided into those four pillars of accountability and justice, of uh, truth telling, of reparations and of measures of non-recurrence? Are there other goals that victim groups have um, that may not fit neatly into those frameworks and are there creative ways that we can think about setting up mechanisms to achieve them? Um, I'm not going to run through the other um, items on here, as I said, I've gone over time, um, but I can, um, for those of you, again, who are interested in seeing um, what you can actually do, I'd be more than happy to set up a call and to think through that in more, um, in more detail. Um, very, um, very, very quickly, um, just a few notes about the handbook for those of you who are interested in using it. Um, it serves as a standalone resource and you don't need special training to use it. Um, you don't need to run workshops to use it, but that can be helpful. I wanted to draw attention to one thing, um, one aspect at the end, there's sort of additional resources, additional reading, including frameworks that can be used um, to sort of um, more theoretically approach the question of transitional justice. Um, but one, one amazing part of the handbook is that um, organizations and experts have agreed to have their name and contact information included in the handbook and it's broken down by the specific chapters. So again, if there are things that I've said that jump out at you as interesting or relevant to your research and you'd like to reach out to one of these people, please do feel free to do so. Um, I'm also thinking it, we don't have a concrete plan to do this, but we're potentially thinking of creating an independent resource that would be more of a living document where we could have um, some of these um, people contributing their, their information as well to this resource. And so I flag that if there are those of you who would be interested in being included in such a resource um, to make yourselves available primarily to victim groups, please let me know. Um, so I, I just want to conclude with a huge thank you. As I mentioned at the start, if you would like to receive a hard copy of the handbook, you're welcome to contact me at my email address here and um, Philip can also share my email address with you if, if, um, if it's not possible to write that down so quickly. Um, I also wanted to say that we will be translating the handbook into Arabic um, and also hopefully we'll be translating it into French. It's a slightly longer term project, um, but stay posted for that. Um, so again, I just want to extend an enormous thank you to all of you for joining and particularly to Philip for bringing us all together. Um, and a huge congratulations to you all for this, um, for this fabulous initiative. And having gone slightly over time, I'm now going to pass over back to Philip um, to take us to the next section. So thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Sarah, for the very insightful trip, you know, across the contents of the handbook. Just to mention that um, you highlighting the fact that some of the traditional transitional justice mechanisms may not actually fit into what the victims want. You know, the first lecture that we had where we brought um, Professor Rutiteto to discuss about the phases of transitional justice over the past two decades. She highlighted the fact that we are entering a phase where transitional justice is being delimited to the fight against corruption. You know, so we deviate the attention of the quest for social justice from the victims themselves to the perpetrator. Without taking the place of Falabres, um, let me just hand over the platform for him to make his own co comments. Thank you very much. I think you are muted. You are muted. Okay. okay. Yeah, I, it's a, it's a, it's a fantastic point, um, Philip. Were you, were you inviting me to speak, or were you inviting Bruce to speak? No. I'm so I, yes, Bruce. Uh, Bruce yeah. as well. I yeah. think he's, he's muted. Yeah. So I wanted. Yeah. To the speak. point. 
The point that you make is a fabulous one. And actually in different contexts, we've seen this, um, this question emerge in, um, in different ways. One is, so in addition to the transitional justice framework being confined to anti-corruption initiatives, we've also seen um, the ways in which terrorism is often used as kind of an alternative, terrorism charges is often used as an alternative. So just to say, I completely agree with that. And I think that's something we could we could talk about more um, in, when it comes to the discussion. So sorry if I jumped in there, but I just wanted to, to wholeheartedly agree. Thanks. It's fine, Sarah, thanks. Okay. Hi, could you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, good. So thank you very much, uh, Philip, for having me, and congratulations to Sarah for your uh, for your book. Um, I think that this handbook, uh, pursuing justice for atrocity for mass atrocity, is uh, a welcome addition to the burgeoning literature on transitional justice. It is a pleasure to read this uh, well-informed handbook written for and from the perspective of victims book. This is really very original. Uh, the flow between the chapters make them uh, easy to read and to follow. I really commend Sarah for such successful writing and presentation of uh, uh, a book. So following a oral presentation, I would like to comment a few points and raise some uh, few questions for discussion. First, uh, the question that structured the handbook. As Sarah wrote it, the question that motivated the handbook is this, what can victim groups do to advance justice for mass atrocities? The question shows clearly that uh, how this handbook is oriented towards action. Though it has a good level of conceptualization of numerous concepts and notions related to uh, transitional justice, it does not aim at a kind of theoretical accu knowledge accumulation. This handbook is a kind of user manual or a user guide intended to assist victim groups to seek justice and accountability for mass atrocities. So this is very interesting. However, e here is my first question. What is your strategy to bring, your strategy to bring this tool to victims of mass atrocities across the world? I know that uh, in chapter six, you have uh, said something about your uh, communication, but uh, this, uh, I would like to have more information. Indeed, this manual is very relevant, and I really hope that victims group around the world can have it in their hands. Otherwise, it will be just one more manual in libraries that victims do not often use. What communication strategy do you propose to make this manual available to, uh, to victims? My second comment is related to uh, both to chapter one and chapter two. In chapter one, uh, Sarah, you presented the framework of uh, transitional justice measures. And in chapter two, you explain how victim groups could use the law, the existing legal processes to seek justice and accountability. These two chapters can open the minds of victims group and ways to, on ways to achieve justice. For example, in chapter one, you explain the role that victims group can play in a reparation program, memorialization efforts, truth commissions, the search for missing person, measures of non-recurrence, public apologies and reconciliation. However, not any victim can be involved in such Activities. You need a minimum of formal education. You need to know how to write, how to speak in public. Uh, you need to have an idea of how public administration functions, etc. The problem is that the majority of uh, survivors of mass atrocities in war-torn countries do not have all these skills. They are usually the poorest population who could not escape they could not flee far away from places where atrocities happened. Very often, they do not even speak the official language used by the administration of the country. Hello? Therefore, 
it becomes difficult for such victims to use the complex legal system to seek justice and accountability for mass atrocities. Likewise, uh, traditional justice mechanisms may not be adapted to resolve mass atrocities crime, as they uh, uh, may reinforce discrimination structures that existed prior to the conflict. This is what you wrote on page eight. This is, very this is a very challenging situation for victims groups who seek justice and accountability for mass atrocities. However, as you stated on page nine, some of these challenges can be overcome by blending traditional methods with more formal justice measures that incorporate procedural safeguards such as due process rights. This means that this manual does not suppress the imagination of victims to find for themselves the most appropriate ways to obtain justice. Indeed, mass atrocities as well as uh, traditional justice mechanisms are very often case specific, context specific. This needs innovation, adaptation, imagination in order to find the, the right and the most effective process for justice and accountability. I'm very pleased that uh, the handbook has taken seriously this challenge by warning in the introduction that uh, although this educational uh, handbook aims to broaden the conversation on transitional justice by putting victims group and the strategy they undertake at the center, we do not aim to offer a one size fit all approach for effective transitional justice. Rather, we hope others can build on our scholarship to continue to advance a more generous, more inclusive understanding of transitional justice. This is what you, you wrote. This is very interesting. So my third comment is related to the identity of victims group and who speaks on behalf of victims group. I had the privilege, the privilege to work with refugees and forcibly displaced people in Cote d'Ivoire, Sierra Leone, and Kenya. Most of these people were survivors of mass atrocity crimes. There was very often a huge fight between uh, survivors for the designation of spokesperson. Associations of victims fight against each other to gain prominence because there is many dividends attached to the qualification of being recognized as victim associations. Moreover, the state is often involved in a way or another when mass atrocities occurs on its territory. In order to, make, to minimize the, its potential uh, responsibility, uh, uh, I mean, plausible responsibility in such mass atrocity crimes, the state may be tempted to control uh, victim association by influencing the choice of the leaders or by helping to create or to sponsor victim associations that are sympathetic to the state. This is the case, for example, uh, in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, for example, Mr. Mr. Uh, Isaac Diaby, the president of the Coalition of Victims Association in Cote d'Ivoire, is very much contested. According to statement from Rival Victim Association, Mr. Diaby only speaks for victims of atrocities committed by the regime of former President Laura Gbagbo and tend to obscure the voices of the victim of uh, atrocities committed by the rebel movement that supported the current president Alassane Ouattara. Everybody knows that during the post-election conflict of 2010 and 2011 that claimed the life of more than 3,000 uh, people, both government and rebel forces committed mass crimes. Therefore, the officially recognized victim associations may sometimes represent only one side. We have to be careful when we work with victim associations. Moreover, roles may have changed during the course of the conflict so that initial perpetrators may become victims with the change in the balance of power. There is a real war of victims or victimhood. Is there any strategy to unite all victims of mass atrocities within the same country? Uh, this is not given. So 
So first, I would like to raise the problem of justice versus revenge and reconciliation versus punishment. Uh, the, research, the research center where I work in Abidjan, Sera Centre de Recherche et d'Action pour la Paix, Center for Research and Action for Peace, is very much involved for two decades in the implementation of reconciliation programs in Cote d'Ivoire. I had the chance to work with uh, victim groups. I can testify that the desire for justice is what deeply resides in the victims uh, of atrocities. However, for several victim associations, justice equals revenge, punishment. Some victims are stuck in the logic of one eye for an eye, two for a tooth. Perpetrators also are also trapped in the fear that victim groups may seek revenge. As you see, both groups are stuck in the past of mass atrocity. How do you move them away from that? Fifth and lastly, there is the problem of trust in national or international justice system. For, viola for violation to rise to the scale of tens of thousands, the bonds that underpin a society are obliterated in the name of political or ethnic cause, or crimes are often driven by the humanization of the perceived enemy. This is a sign of the failure of the state and also the failure of the international community. In the aftermath, in the aftermath of such massive violence, victims struggle to trust the state and the international organizations and foreign states as we see right now in Afghanistan. Uh, in the middle of the conflict, state will abandon the, the state will abandon the population and foreign countries will fly their citizens out of the country. Everybody will come back later after atrocities have been uh, already committed to talk about justice. For example, in the city of Dwekwe in uh, Western Cote d'Ivoire, where uh, more than 800 people were killed during uh, 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 the war uh, and where I am uh, actually doing interviews for research projects, most of the victims of the post-election conflict do not trust the state, the justice system of the state, neither the international justice system or international organization. How could they seek justice and accountability and accountability if they do not trust any justice system? This is a huge problem. So these are, these are only a few questions for uh, our discussion of such a useful and well-written handbook. My hope is that uh, it will inspire victims across the world to find their own voices and way to pursue justice and accountability for mass atrocity crimes. So congratulations, Sarah, and many thanks to the Simon Scott Center for the Prevention of uh, Genocide for having sponsored the publication of this book. I hope that really this book will live uh, uh, will have a very long life. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Fabrice, for that very wonderful analysis of it. You know, it's a beauty when you hear scholar practitioners, you know, discuss about the practical issues on the field. And I'm particularly enthused by your um by one of your concluding points on the failure of the justice system, both at national level and the international level. And I want to also bring us back to Afghanistan, for instance, where, of course, there has been amnesty, release of political prisoners. And just a bit of reference to what the President of the United States said when at the beginning of the invasion, or let's say the encroachment of Taliban back to seize over power that they have left two decades ago. He said that the, um, the Afghans will have to take their own destiny into their own hands. And today, there's a, there was an interview on CNN today where he was saying that there is no right time. There, there couldn't have been a right time to move the U.S. troops away from Afghanistan. 15 years ago, they would have said it was too early. Maybe 15 years from now, they would have said it was too late. So the issue is that the bulk always remains, you know, at the doorstep of the nation itself to tackle whatever grievances is had, irrespective of the international community. Because if you look at the history of mass atrocities globally, 
You're talking of the case of Rwanda, where there was delayed intervention. Even now, people are already calling the international community in Afghanistan. And it's like there's zero presence in terms of discussions and quotes. Even if some sovereign nations are already identifying with the Taliban government, in spite of people moving out en masse, people being prevented to even access the airport and stuff like that, you know? So we, I think we need to revisit the structure of our international law, you know, and its provisions and how relevant it is today within today's context, especially when we're even looking at the digital age where information seems to be like the new form of empowerment for people. And how can we leverage on these digital tools to hate people within the context of you know, mass atrocities? So um, I think we have a question in the chat. So please, you can type your questions in the chat or raise your hand if you want to speak so that we can take them. So I think the first, the, so Sarah, do you want to respond to what he said before we go into the question and answer session? Yeah. I'd, I'd love to. I, I can be as brief as possible. And I, I just want to um, thank you both for your extraordinarily kind words about the handbook. I think we're all on the same page as hoping that it can be as useful um, as possible. And I think the points that you raise are phenomenal and ones that we certainly wrestled with when we were putting this together. I won't, I won't um, take too much time um, kind of responding um, in too much detail, but I do want to say a few things that, that might um, help us think about these, these issues more. The first that I'll pick up on is also the one that, that Philip just mentioned about the lack of trust in the international justice system. And a couple of things that I, that I wanted to, to flag here is one that um, when we talk about international justice, I often hear um, members of the international community referring to it as an experiment. Um, and we've seen different approaches taken in different cases over the years. You mentioned um, the case of Rwanda, and now we're looking at um, contemporary cases and, and what the international community can do. And I think that the word experiment has, has strengths and weaknesses. Strength in the sense that I think it does accurately reflect in many ways um, the approach towards international justice um, in terms of, uh, you know, I think that, that Brees mentioned um, the, the language of that there's no one size fits all, um, but also we don't know what's going to work until we try it and we try to learn lessons from the past. But there's also something um, troubling about that for victim groups themselves who perhaps don't want to be seen as an experiment, but who want to receive justice. Um, and so I think what we wanted to do with the handbook was in some ways to put the question, to reframe the question of the lack of trust in the international justice community and say, there are many resources devoted to those audiences about what they can do to improve their systems. And these are important. And it's an initiative that these organizations must undertake. And what we wanted to say was to, to victim groups, the system is flawed. There are many problems with the system. And this is what you can do to operate in the system despite all of the problems that you see. Um, so that's kind of how we wanted to tackle that question. So just to say, you know, I, I think we really agree with you that the system is flawed and we understand why there's a lack of trust um, among victim groups in the international justice system, particularly when at times it's described as an experiment. Um, but just to say that uh, we're hoping that the handbook can kind of navigate that careful line. Um, and I'd love to have um, more conversations um, with others who, who may have taken a look at the handbook too to see if we've achieved that. Um, the other that I quickly wanted to address um, was this question of infighting versus collaboration between victim groups whose voice is heard. Um, what happens when a victim group purports to speak on behalf of a particular community at the exclusion of others? Um, and then also the very challenging question of what happens when victims become perpetrators themselves. Um, and I think this is where we get into really tangled um, issues of transitional justice and how it can actually look in practice. Um, but I think I, I just wanted to mention a couple of things on that point. 
One is that we, in the handbook, um, draw a distinction between victim groups and victim coalitions. And so the difference that we see here is that, I'm just <laughs> looking at the handbook here, um, the, the difference that we identify is that victim groups, we think of victim groups that typically represent a specific affected community or a specific population. They may be, for instance, in um, a displaced person camp where they have various forms of organization or in communities um, and they kind of perhaps know each other already and are part of the same community. And then we talk about victim coalitions, which is where victim groups across different, um, a, different affected communities actually come together. And so what we wanted to do with the handbook was to highlight that as an option to say that victim groups don't always have the same goals. Sometimes it's very difficult for victim groups to come together, but that ultimately for the quest for justice, the, the more that there's able to be collaboration and diversity of representation within the, the victim groups that have the loudest voices, um, the hypothesis is that the transitional justice mechanisms um, can be more effective um, and also that uh, more voices can be heard um, and that they can have a louder voice that, um, that the international community is focused on, on what it is that victim groups writ large, victim coalitions, I should say, writ large, want to achieve um, without, without being taken down a particular path of one victim group. Now, I should say, that the handbook is written for victim groups, not for victim coalitions. And I know that the divide between the two is, is perhaps um, somewhat um, you know, flexible in different cases, but we at the same time wanted to acknowledge that working together as a coalition across different communities isn't possible in every case, and it's also not always appropriate. And there's still things that victim groups can do. Um, and so I, th I think that's the way that we wanted to approach that question. Um, you also mentioned a couple of other really, really interesting points, and I'll, I'll, um, I'll take them very quickly. Um, one is this idea of justice versus revenge. What does it mean when a victim group's goal is to um, have, have uh, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, as you said? Um, and again, I think this goes back to the point of why um, having a holistic, thoughtful, transitional justice framework um, is so important. Um, having ways to resolve disputes specifically um, and, and to sort of combat a culture of denial that may be prevailing in countries that have experienced mass atrocities. Um, and so I, I think just to say that, um, again, perhaps to the earlier point of the, the system is flawed, um, and this is one potential path forward, with an alternative. And I think, again, the theory of transitional justice is that if people's need, needs are actually met, then um, people don't, don't kind of want to go into active conflict with one another. And if their, their needs, if their voice can be heard, if their needs can be met in other ways, then, um, then that's, you know, um, so much more valuable. And then finally, um, on the question of outreach, this is actually where I would invite, um, invite our audience as well to, to reach out to me if you have um, victim organizations that you work with that you think would be interested in the handbook. We are doing a variety of things, including conducting consultations um, with, with specific victim groups who have questions that we might be able to answer. We'd hope to be able to travel around physically with the handbook, but the COVID situation won't, won't permit that. And so what we're looking at doing is printing copies of the handbook in country and then having civil society partners who might be hosting workshops with victim groups to distribute and hand out the handbook. Um, and we're also wanting to kind of embed it into the work of the civil society organizations that work directly with victim groups who might be in a better position to sort of translate the findings and use those um, recommendations in the handbook as a basis for, um, for further discussion with the communities that they're engaging with. Um, 
We also, you know, um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, are planning to translate the handbook into Arabic and French, which we hope will also help, um, you know, hearing that so many of these resources exist. I think, Brice, um, you the way that you put it was they just kind of sit in the library that victim groups never see. And I think that the language barrier is something that we persistently heard as a problem, that these resources are usually exclusively in English. They need to be in other languages. As for the minority languages, an even longer term goal is perhaps to develop discrete resources in some minority languages. Um, and that's again an area where we would invite discussion um, with people on this call and others in your network about ways that aspects of the, the handbook could be translated into um, languages that um, are, are spoken by affected communities, whether they be audiovisual or written resources um, or ideas for workshops. Um, but the, the beauty of the handbook is that we don't actually need to be there for people to use it. And we really just hope that people will read it and, and kind of take, take flight with it and use it in the ways we're always here as a resource to brainstorm how specifically it might be useful in a particular case. But um, again, thanks for the question about outreach. It's one that we're continuously grappling, grappling with. So I will, I will pause there and, and hand it back to Philip. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, um, Sarah, for those very useful comments. I think uh, because of time, let's just go to the questions. I've also sent some that I received privately. So the first um, question is um, the possibility of transitional justice within what is referred to as a good state or a state that is controlled by non-state actors. So, yeah. Yeah, great question. Um, and I think this this draws attention. I, I having not participated in the previous discussions, I don't know how into the weeds we've got in terms of the framework of transitional justice here. But what this question points to, I think, is one of the the challenges of using the transitional justice framework. Um, not only does it assume that the primary perpetrator, I think, is a government where we're transitioning from one regime to the next and trying to hold them accountable in the process, um, but also that uh, that there is um, kind of, I, I guess, underlying that, a transition that's actually occurring, a transition of power. Um, some of the specific transitional justice mechanisms that we discuss um, in the handbook can be available and used. I'm thinking particularly of searches for missing persons um, and, and memorialization um, and also reconciliation and peace building that can occur even um, where, where non-state actors are responsible. I think particularly of the case of the Yazidis in um, Northern Iraq, where the Iraqi government um, has actually been really um, powerful advocates for justice in many ways. Um, against ISIS perpetrators, um, obviously non-state actors there. So I think that there are ways that, that that can be tackled within the framework of transitional justice, but just to quickly say, I think that this is another area where, um, where it could be fertile territory for, for further research. How does transitional justice work in cases where you don't necessarily have the deep pockets of a state to provide reparations? Um, and where individual perpetrators might be held to account. Um, how, do you, how do you grapple with that question? How do you approach it? It's a really, really good question, one for further research. So, so thanks, Emmanuel. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I think Aminu Ayatu has the hand up. Whether if you could quickly just ask your question or make your comment, yeah. Okay, thank you, uh, Sarah. That has been a very wonderful uh, um, output. But I just want to quickly uh, still put across this uh, sort of uh, follow-up question uh, on the question that was asked about uh, how uh, victims can really make use of the uh, I mean manual to really understand and uh, how they can practically put that uh, you know uh, into use. But uh, I just want to say that, I, do you have any thought about uh, the different, uh, I mean, the strategies uh, that the manual can be used to really scale down uh, this? Because most of what is contained there uh, is mostly understood by those who are, uh, I mean, enlightened and uh, who can really, you know, uh, I mean, think along with, with, with the logic of uh, uh, those points that are presented in the text. So how does, how do you think of, uh, 
that being really scaled down to 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 to, to the uh, victims so that they can really understand uh, what they are supposed to do about that. Absolutely, and I think what you're touching there on as well is this this notion that there might be um, upper echelons potentially of when you talk about hierarchies, potentially of victim groups and how certain groups might be able to access it. Just a couple of things on that. One is that um, the handbook is written directed at victim groups, um, not at civil society and not at people who are working with victim groups deliberately. But what we envisage is that those groups that are working with victim groups um, and pot potentially ones who um, have less access to resources but are tapped into um, civil society, um, that those organisations working with victim groups can use the handbook as a resource in their engagement with them. So when victim groups are approaching them with difficult strategic questions, the civil society organisation can go back and say, look, well, this has worked in that case, this hasn't worked in that case, and this is what could work in our case, how do we think about that? I think as well um, that, that, uh, um, that I think this is why it's, it's important. It was important to us, despite all of the complexities that you talk about in terms of addressing a product like this to victim groups, um, in terms of reaching them, but we really wanted to make sure that there were resources, resources directed at them. And so again, this is where we have um, talk about kind of producing other discrete resources and also having these bilateral conversations, using the handbook as a starting point, using some of the visual resources in there, translating it into other languages and having organizations. You know, it's another reason why I was so excited to present here because I'm hoping that this can get into the bloodstream, that you can read it um, from the perspective perhaps of an outsider, but then use it to inform your discussion and engagement with victim groups um, and those that work closely with them. So I hope that addresses the question. Thanks, Amini. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much, Sarah. There's another question on trying to integrate community leaders within the context of giving local agencies to victims, you know, without getting them compromised. I think this has to do with the proximity of community leaders to corruption or corrupt practices, you know, when they try to like, you know, um, act within coalitions or within victim groups in, in the quest for justice? How do we ensure that they are not compromised by those in, in, in authority? Yeah. Such a great question. And I would point you to, um, I, I think that this question is tackled in one section of the handbook that uses Guatemala as a case study where there was actually a commission that was set up by the international community to focus on the question of corruption. It was really interesting because one, one thing that it served to do was to kind of combat a culture of denial in the country and to highlight the fact that people in positions of power were in fact um, taking, taking money from the public coffers and not, um, not using them for, for society, but for their own benefit. Um, and so those proceedings, um, the, something similar happened in Peru as well, almost cracked the door open to allow an appetite for justice to, to flourish. Um, and so I, I think that those efforts, now that commission has, has since been closed, um, but I think in terms of uh, marginalizing perpetrators, there can actually be quite a lot of value in, in going down that line. And I think this is, again, where we come back to the second chapter to see where the different legal tools can build towards criminal accountability and they can all be important. Now, it's not to say that, um, that the story should end at corruption proceedings. Again, I mentioned terrorism proceedings in other cases and the issue being that it doesn't actually get to the heart of what victims experienced. And so we can question how, how just is that if we're, if we're stopping at corruption proceedings. But I think it's a great point in terms of opening the door, creating a little bit more space to um, distance and marginalize perpetrators, particularly among communities that may support them um, still despite the atrocities that have occurred. Okay, thank you very much. The next one is on, on uh, building coalitions. That at what point is it like fit? Is, it, is that like a specific period in the experiences of the victims where 
they think that's important for them not to act alone, but to go into a coalition of different groups acting together? Again, that's a fantastic question. Um, and I think I would point you also to kind of the second part of the chapter in, that, in the handbook, but just to say that it is ultimately a question for individual victim groups to make. Um, and what we found is that it can be a really valuable approach, particularly when there are victim groups that have been targeted by a common perpetrator and who actually may have a similar goal, but who aren't speaking to one another because they're from different communities. And so in those cases where actually when you get down to it, and this is again where, um, where scholars and academics can be particularly useful in uh, helping victim groups from different populations to identify their goals, that when you step back, you may actually see we want to achieve the same thing. And by coming together and unifying their voice, it makes it easier for decision makers to say, okay, well, we're going to take this step, that step, and the other step, rather than hearing several different voices coming from different angles or asking for different things or perhaps the same thing, but in different ways. So I think that situation where you have, particularly where you have victim groups um, targeted by a common perpetrator who ultimately kind of underneath it all have similar justice goals, which often um, is actually the case, um, then there can be valuable ways for those groups to come together despite their differences. Um, and, and so, again, I would just refer you um, sort of the, the second part of, of chapter six, um, or the chapter on, on coalition building addresses that in more detail. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. The next one is um, about um, how integral your handbook is to people who have like, um, um, who are living with physical disabilities that do, 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 does the handbook take care of their specific challenges, yeah? Yeah, um, such an important question. And, and actually, I think what's interesting, I'm not sure if this is the context that you're thinking of, but the example that comes to mind is, um, is coalitions of, for instance, amputees that um, have lost limbs during conflict and who are living in displaced person camps um, with very few resources who may come together as an organization, as a nascent organization. Um, and so there is mention, um, I believe there's a case study um, involving a, a um, association of amputees who came together initially um, around kind of their common, um, their common plight, but then were able to kind of push beyond that and, um, and kind of incorporate a broader um, a broader kind of spectrum of, of victims. But just to say that the handbook is, is fairly brief and it's, it doesn't get into all of the details of that. And I think this is again where further research would be fantastic. And, and again, working, the idea of the handbook is to provide some recommendations, guidance, um, case studies that people can then use, um, the organizations that work with victim groups can then use to provide tailored advice based on the specific um, situation. But um, it's, it's a fantastic question and one that we gently touch on um, in a couple of places in there. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think you said you have a bit of experience in South Sudan. So I think maybe from that context, you could also help us, you know, to discuss the role of traditional leaders, gatekeepers in terms of pursuing justice for victim groups within the African context, yeah. This is a meaty question. This is a, um, thank you, Evanisa, for this question. It's, it's um, I'm, I'll try and answer it as best I can, but ultimately say that as um, I will be, I will say that as a white woman from the global north, um, I'm not the, the best person to answer this. I would actually look to you. And in fact, Ebenezer, um, I might, I might if, if Philip would, would allow, if Ebenezer wants to kind of elaborate a little bit more in, on this question and, and let us know what his thinking on this is. As Philip mentioned, um, I, have, I have come into this, this question a lot and um, it is a really important one and, you know, thinking about the, the word gatekeepers, I think is really fantastic. But I would, you know, if, if 
Philip would allow it to, um, I, I would love to actually hear from um, Ebenezer about this and then, you know, perhaps I can respond. Um, but Philip, I'll, I'll ask you if that's okay. Yeah, no, it's fine, Ebenezer. Yeah, Ebenezer is actually our internship coordinator, is an integral oh, part great. of the context. Lovely yeah. to meet you and thanks for your thoughtful <laughs> question. Yeah, yeah uh, Ebenezer, okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah, for that uh, beautiful presentation. So I, I actually asked that question because uh, I'm a, uh, in my work generally, I try to, you know, to, uh, to assay the role of traditional institutions. So for instance, in, in engendering justice, peace and stuff like that. So as a matter of fact, I had my uh, master's in peace and conflict studies. And what my uh, HEMIP thesis focused on was the role of you know traditional leaders in a particular African community, you know, in restoring peace, justice, and stuff like that. So, and what I've noticed is that when we are talking about justice uh, as if uh, you know as a concept, as a framework, or whatever we want to term it, we tend to focus too much on international institutions, you know, the UN, uh, WTO, and other organizations like that, while you know ignoring that most of these communities where we're even talking about, especially victims groups, have some sort of structures, traditional structures through which they govern themselves, you know, but due to this idea of modernity, we are, we are relegating many of these traditional institutions. And if you look at it very well, even now, uh, well, the traditional institutions and structures are much more closer, at, at least I'm very much familiar with the African context. The traditional institutions and, you know, and people are much more uh, closer to the people than even someone coming from the UN, you know, somebody who was drafted from an office in Abuja and stuff like that. So I'm very much interested in, you know, how we can bring traditional leaders on board. And that's, that is very closely related to a question that uh, Dr. Philip read out the other time, that how, do we, how can we bring traditional leaders, gatekeepers on board when we are talking about getting justice for victims group? So that, that was why I had that question. If you have you know, any expertise on the African context, how can they be drafted in and stuff like that to sort of engender justice? That, I mean, an amazing question. And Ebenezer, what I might do actually is share with you a report that our colleagues in South Sudan recently published, which actually um, we call it like a justice landscape assessment. And it, walks through um, the different dimensions of available justice options in South Sudan and what's being done, including on the traditional um, community-based approaches. You might find it interesting just to see what has been done in that context and how, what challenges it's come up. So um, I'll make sure if, if Philip can connect us, I'll make sure to, to send that to you and anyone else who's interested to read that. Um, but I think that the point that you raise is, is absolutely spot on. Um, and I would say that there is, there is a small section on it in the handbook, but the careful line to toe is one that um, doesn't displace the, the needs of affected communities. Um, and still leverages the important um, role that, that community-based um, leaders and, and traditional leaders have. Um, and so I think really what, what we want to do with the handbook and what the vision is, is to find ways to bring people on board around a common goal. And so in that respect, in many ways, the handbook is an invitation to those who share the goals of victim groups to participate in their effort. And again, this is where the coalitions come in, in terms of having victims at the heart and victims at the center, and then allies and community leaders and stakeholders around them supporting their effort rather than it being the other way around. On top of that, too, as a separate kind of issue, are the actual value of, of traditional mechanisms that can be adapted. Um, in the handbook, we talk about the Fambul talk um, that was used in Sierra Leone that um, Philip's nodding, you may be familiar with that, and I won't, I won't um, explain, explain it now. We also have the example of the Kachacha courts in, in South Africa that um, have, have been analysed and faced some, you know, face some challenges and, and I think just to say that's another that's another way that um, that these so it can be 
married in and interwoven with transitional justice mechanisms, but also can be standalone. Um, and so it's a great question um, and, and one that, um, again, um, and you yourself are undertaking it, but I think is one that's a really rich and important area for further research and, and is really context specific. Yeah, thank you very much. If I could just chip in within the, I think Gajata was in Rwanda actually after the genocide. Um, the, yeah, no, nah, fine. So, sorry, was, sorry. No, it's okay, it's okay. So the Faboon talk is just like bringing a family gathering together for them to discuss issues. You know, and I think it's still on. I think they have a very active platform on Twitter as well. Of course, you can't access that from Nigeria at the moment. So, but I wanted to talk from the Nigerian context of incorporating leaders, you know, within the um, transitional or um, the, the coalition framework for victims. And to say that within my own experience in the civil society in Nigeria, especially in the Northeast, I think the most beneficiaries of the interventions so far of humanitarian interventions and even of um, interventions of civil society organizations have been the community leaders. So you're always targeting community leaders, religious leaders, and these are people that you think are influential within the community. So they go through series of training, they bring them together in terms of engagement, and even, the, even when you want to share reliefs or even try to devise measures of um, you know, intervening in these communities, some of these community leaders are brought together, especially the imams who they feel that they are very influential within an Islamic setting, you know, in the Northeast. But again, the challenge is, if you look across to the South, South, South in Niger Delta, for instance, there has been allegations that those who posed as militants in the past, and I think um, Florence is here, if she wants to say a word or two on this, it is, she's also a very active civil society member in Nigeria. You know, she is well versed in the South, South, South context. You know, within the South South, there's been um, allegations of compromise of people who were like former leaders of militants in the trenches and when they had access to power or they compromised. And so it's, it's a bit tricky. It's a, it's a tricky one managing leadership because when there's a face to a coalition, for instance, the, and it's like in a formal setting, like I think Farabiz was talking about those who are not as literate, you know, in the Western paradigm, you know, to engage in some of these coalitions. When you put a face to it, and these people are not a bit, uh, sincere about their interventions, you know, they, they tend to compromise and don't represent the interest of the victims. So I think it's something like Sarah mentioned that we need to uh, explore in terms of looking at ways in which community leaders can be less compromised and represent the interest of the people. Also to remember that in most transitioning societies or in societies that have undergone and transition in terms of governance, some of the perpetrators end up being, you know, in government. Liberia is a very um, good example for this. You know, Salif was actually recommended, uh, President Salif was recommended for prosecution. She became, you know, the president and you wonder what tone she was supposed to have in terms of the proceedings of the Truth Commission there. So I think it's something that um, as researchers and academics, we need to explore to see what fits into our own context in terms of leadership. We know that these people have reverent power when it comes to leaders within the community, but is it possible to also identify youth groups, especially as we are drifting towards the age of the internet of things, these people who are active, who can form coalition, very digital space, you know, and try to build them into leaders that can, you know, represent the interest of people from, from their own platform. Uh, this, this is just my own thoughts on those. So I think there's still one more question, um, which is uh, um, getting justice for, okay, the duration of justice for victim groups. Is, is there a way in which we can expedite action when it comes to um, access to justice for some of these victim groups? So it's not enduring and frustrating for them. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I will certainly answer that question. And just one, one on the previous point, um, just to wrap it up. I'm so delighted to hear, to hear, to be introduced to this community because I do get asked these questions. And often my answer is, as I said, you know, I look to you as the experts in your particular context of how that can be navigated. 
Um, and I, I say for those of you who are interested, I may, may reach out to you in the future um, and potentially connect you if you're willing to people who are grappling with this question to share your experiences um, because I think that's that's much more valuable than than kind of me coming in from the outside. Um, but such an important question and one that certainly um, requires considerable attention. But in terms of the process taking decades, I think just to keep it brief, one of the perhaps misconceptions about justice is that it's only achieved when the perpetrator is held to account at the International Criminal Court or some other international forum, a hybrid court, what have you. Um, and, and so I think that what we want to say in the handbook is that there are actually many other forms of justice that can take place along the way that can help build momentum towards a broader picture of justice, but which in the interim are actually valuable and shouldn't be dismissed in and of themselves as justice goals. And that every win is actually can actually be seen as a as a goal in and of itself. Um, and so I think that's briefly that that while the, the um, arc of history um, is long and while this can take decades, I, um, I hope that readers of the handbook may may see that there are actually other ways that can happen in the interim of, of achieving different forms of justice, even as the longer justice effort takes a long time to unfold. I think you're on mute there. Okay, sorry. Thank you very much, Sarah. I was actually, so I wish to thank you very much for sharing your experience with us and taking us through the importance of this book. And I hope that this is the beginning of a conversation, you know, to accept, um, for people to access it. I'm sharing the title of our next Distinguished Personality Lecture, which is coming up in October. You know, for those who are going to join us, we have somebody, a, a diplomat from the Netherlands, joining us to discuss within the African context of how we can talk about the, the link between development, you know, and peace. Father Brice, we are happy for uh, with your contributions and for raising very important questions on this book, you know, from your work on the field. We thank every person who has joined us for this very important event. Well, the time is passed, so I wouldn't like to take much of your time. But you can follow us via our social media network for networks, which is in the chat for all our events. I hope to see you in our subsequent programs very soon. Thank you very much and have a lovely day, everyone, at whatever time zone you are in. So see you soon. Bye. Okay, thank you, Celine. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Ciao, ciao. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Ciao, ciao. Thank you, thank you, thank bye. you for attending. Bye. Good to see you. Yeah. Bye, bye, bye. 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 <laughs> <laughs>